Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Adrian is on assignment. Tonight, new coronavirus cases raising a big question. They didn't travel to an infected zone or even know anyone who did. So how did they get sick? That means we are all susceptible to it. If we do get a significant exposure, we will get infected. What you can do to get prepared. A meeting designed to cool tensions, but outside. You guys know it! Breaking up families, right? Divisions within the Wet'suwet'en nation are laid bare. I'm just not going to accept it. Not without a fight anyways. Thousands say airlines are breaking the new passenger rights rules, and Ottawa is struggling to keep up. And do your appliances not seem to last? Oh, yeah. They're tough to fix, so should you have the right to repair? This is The National. One by one, countries are losing the battle to keep the coronavirus out. And the head of the World Health Organization is warning that any country thinking it will be spared is making a fatal mistake. We're at a decisive point. Borders aren't stopping the disease. Within the span of a week, the number of countries with confirmed cases of COVID-19 surged from 27 to 49, with caseloads within countries growing as well. It's enough to spook markets, which so far this week in the U.S. have lost more than 10% of their value. Now, worldwide, the flu typically claims hundreds of thousands of lives every year. This coronavirus, by comparison, fewer than 3,000 so far. But COVID-19 is unknown, it is unpredictable, with signs now of transmission within countries. Vic Adopia is tracking that. Isolated at this hospital in California's capital is a patient like no other in the U.S., a woman whose coronavirus infection can't be traced to travel overseas. What this changes is that screening for travel is probably not enough anymore, is it? Because we know that there's community transmission. The case exposed how U.S. federal health officials may have dropped the ball. At first, they refused to test the sick woman because she didn't have a travel history. Today, the governor revealed there are thousands of sick people who need to be tested for the coronavirus, but only 200 test kits are available. Diagnostic testing as our top priority, not just in the state of California, but I imagine all across the United States. This town in western Germany is not taking any chances. School is cancelled after a teacher and her husband tested positive for the coronavirus. The origin of their infection also unknown. <laughs> The mood is depressed, says this man. No one knows what's going on. It's a scenario health officials in Canada say they are preparing for. Right now, it's usually only sick people who had traveled to a short list of countries that are tested. This Toronto health official says that will soon change. So I think the kind of thing that we're looking at now is to assess individuals who present with influenza-like illness and to expand testing to that population or to those who are admitted to hospital and require respiratory testing. For most of those who test positive for the coronavirus, the symptoms are mild and short-lived, but it's people over 50 who are at the highest risk of severe illness and even death. Vic Adopia, CBC News, Toronto. In Italy, the impact of the virus and the fear that it spreads has been pretty dramatic. Cases have jumped to 650. That's up from 400 yesterday and up from a week ago when there were just three cases. Most are in the country's north, but the hit on tourism is being felt throughout the country. And Italy's economic growth had been the slowest in Europe before all of this started. Now, with 2,000 confirmed infections, South Korea is a COVID-19 hotspot. About 700 cases emerging over the past 24 hours alone. As Sasha Petrasik explains, even as the pace of new cases in China slows down, the rest of Asia is searching for a strategy. On the front lines of South Korea's battle against the coronavirus, disinfectant is the weapon of choice. People just won't come to the market unless they feel safe, she says. Indeed, reassurance combined with modest restrictions is Korea's approach to stopping this epidemic, a clear contrast to China's strategy of locking down hundreds of millions. But with the number of daily new cases here now surpassing those in China, it's not clear if that will work. 
The original infections spread from a church last week, racing through the congregation, helped along by the denomination's practice of sitting tightly together. It's the perfect environment for spreading infection, says a former church member. There's now a surge in testing and a rush to isolate and treat the sick. In Japan, the numbers are only a tenth of Korea's, but even so, the government is worried. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has shut down big sports and cultural events and, in an unprecedented move, ordered schools closed until April, a period he calls critical. This has shocked parents, but it could prevent an even bigger shock, the cancellation of Tokyo's Summer Olympics, or maybe games with no one in the stands. Have the event, but, uh, but encourage people to stay home and watch it on their platforms, gotcha. as opposed to showing up in a, in, a, in a crowded stadium and coughing all over other people in the, in the stadium. The World Health Organization agrees there are ways to make the games safe without cancelling them. But at this point, it says any such decision is still far off. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Hong Kong. Now, Canada announced two new coronavirus cases today, one in Ontario, the other in Quebec. That brings the total to 14. It's not a big number, but it's big enough that some Canadians are asking how to protect themselves. Ali Chiasson takes that question on. I could not be able to leave my house right now, and I'm good for a month. Easy. You don't necessarily have to be like Alex Vizina, someone who has a master's degree in emergency management. I'm a, a base level of preparedness all the time. But as COVID-19 continues to spread abroad, and more people here in Canada are self-isolating for 14 days, it may be time to ask yourself. Do you have food? Do you have any specific medications that you need to survive? Because if you have a medical condition that requires uh, insulin for diabetes or what have you, do you have that? Uh, do you have an arrangement with uh, your doctor in Canada Post or whoever to get it delivered to you? In an effort to prevent public panic, health experts urge Canadians to view the situation in context. So right now there isn't COVID-19 circulating rampantly through Canada. And there is such a thing as being overprepared. And we've seen that, for example, with masks, you know, don't use a mask in public if you're not feeling symptoms or if you're not been asked to wear a mask um, because we need to conserve our supplies. With March break coming up, a lot of Canadians are really concerned about their travel plans, wondering if it's safe enough to go. If people are going in a zone, in an area, in a country, which we already know there is an issue, uh, people should really think twice because obviously it's about their health and safety. You need to think about that if you or your family member gets sick while you're abroad, are you in a country where you're okay using the healthcare system? Our health officials say the risk of transmission here remains low. And to keep it that way, we should be doing the same kinds of things we do to protect ourselves during flu season. That's washing our hands, avoiding people who are sick and staying home if you are sick and seeking medical attention when you need it. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Now, amid fears over how the coronavirus outbreak could affect the global economy, global markets plunged today. The Dow Jones Industrial Average dropped by nearly 1,200 points. That's more than 4% in a single day, and that continues a downward trend that we have been watching all week. Peter Armstrong joining us now. So, Peter, help us make sense of all of this. What's going on? Well, you know, in a lot of ways, I think Wall Street was actually kind of hoping for good news. We saw the sell-off slow yesterday, and it even tried, markets tried to get back into positive territory today, and then more bad news. New cases in the U.S. and Europe, and boom, the sell-off resumed. And now, I mean, the Dow's lost 3,200 points in the last five days. That's like an 11% drop, which puts us officially into correction territory. And the sell-off today was the biggest points drop in the history of the Dow. Really? Look, nothing compares? In well, history. in points. And it's important to make that distinction. That a percentage drop. I mean, in 1987, Black Monday was like a 23% drop in the Dow. This is like a 4.4%. And that context really matters. But what we're looking at here is a broad-based sell-off that's hitting a lot of sectors and a lot of categories. And, you know, we're looking at fear. Fear about the coronavirus itself, but also fear that the global economy 
that was already slowing might be slowed further by this. And if the global economy slows, the U.S. economy slows, everybody loses out. Right. And, and looking at the TSX, I mean, they, they had a different sort of a problem, right? Well, they, they had to shut down trading today in the midst of this. I mean, the TSX was in the same sort of sell-off as everybody else. And then there's some kind of a technical halt. And now the company that owns the TSX is saying that it was a problem with order entry, essentially how they, they process the, the buying and the selling. Uh, there was some speculation that maybe it had something to do with unusually high volume, uh, which should get some more information on that as the, the week goes on, but we'll have to watch and see what happens with the TSX when it opens tomorrow morning. Peter Armstrong, thanks very much. You bet. Well, in BC today, a moment weeks in the making. Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs met face to face with provincial and federal politicians hoping to see eye to eye on a pipeline that has sparked protests across Canada. But as Chris O'Neill Yates shows us, outside the meeting, tempers flared. Spring hasn't arrived in northern British Columbia just yet, but the arrival of Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations Carolyn Bennett signals the first sign of a thaw in relations between Ottawa and the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs. This is the chiefs meeting and that we want uh, to reassure them that we are very interested in working with them uh, on uh, the issues of rights and title and the kinds of things that, that really will matter to the future of their nation. The conditions the chief set out in order to agree to this meeting today were that the coastal gas link pipeline, the company, remove its presence from this road leading to the pipeline. As well, they wanted the RCMP to remove their patrols. Both of them have done that, so for the first time in quite a while, this road is quiet today. Currently, it's our agenda and we can't allow them to steer the agenda. They've already seen what's happened across Canada and we have more than a willingness for all of that to cease, but there has to be some positive progressive changes. But not everybody in the Wet'suwet'en nation supports the hereditary chiefs or their position on the pipeline. Some who support the project arrived just before the meeting started. You guys know that breaking up families, right? Those divisions on full display. See, you've seen how families are being divided, and it shouldn't be like that. It will, it, you know, we need to move forward in reconciliation in order for us to do that. We need to work together as one, and that's not happening. The meeting ended after just three hours. And the mood in the room today? It's very good, very good, very, res very, very respectful. They'll be back tomorrow, but Bennett and Fraser are really the warm-up act, laying the groundwork for the politicians the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs really want to meet with. BC Premier John Horgan and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, Smithers, BC. Elsewhere in Canada, there are still some solidarity protests happening, including in Tyendinaga, Ontario. Demonstrators piled pallets and tires along the tracks again today, lighting them on fire as freight trains passed by. Police arrested 10 people there on Monday after protests stopped CN trains for more than two weeks. Now in Ganawage, Quebec, the blockade remains. But as Alison Northcott shows us, even as tensions rise with the province, protesters have hope for a solution soon. This show of solidarity remains as people in Ganawage watch that BC meeting closely. The blockade on a CP rail line has cancelled commuter rail traffic for thousands of people for nearly three weeks. With today's talks, there is some hope it could end soon. We're watching and we want to see how it's going to impact what we're doing here because it's always been about standing in solidarity with the Wet'suwet'en. But there's frustration too after comments by Quebec's Premier Francois Legault yesterday suggesting some on the territory are armed with AK-47s. Mr. Legault uh, uh, owes an apology uh, to the people of, of, of Ganawake for insinuating that, uh, that we're armed or, and the, the demonstrators and protesters are armed. And I, I think that's very dangerous. But in a statement, Legault's office said he won't apologize, saying it's a very delicate subject. But the Premier made a point of informing Quebecers, facts are facts. For some residents, the comments sting. We always get it turned on us that, you know, we're uh, a violent people or, you know, and it, it's so far from the truth. CP obtained an injunction against this and other Quebec blockades earlier this week. Some were removed, but the local Mohawk police force says the injunction hasn't been served here yet, and the police chief has said they'd have no interest in enforcing one. 
the peacekeepers are the only police force that is going to operate in Gunawage. A spokesperson for the traditional government here says it will be up to the people at this camp to decide when to take the blockade down. Once the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs say they're satisfied with the progress they've made. Allison Northcott, CBC News, Gunawage. Now to the new Air Passenger Bill of Rights and the mounting concerns that airlines aren't following the new rules. In fact, the number of complaints has been so overwhelming, Canada's transportation regulator can't even process them all. Here's Sarah Levitt with the backlog and why flyers are so frustrated. I'm just not going to accept it. Not without a fight anyways. A cruise missed and a vacation ruined. Ken Way says it's all because of a delayed Air Canada flight. By the time we got to the port, uh, the ship had uh, sailed. Way filed for compensation to Air Canada but was denied. I got a response back saying, I'm sorry, our, our reason doesn't qualify under the uh, Passenger Compensation Act because it was a safety-related issue. And then they said it was a scheduling-related issue. The air passenger rights regulations for delayed and cancelled flights took effect December 15th. The Canadian Transportation Agency has launched an inquiry into how the regulations are being handled. In the past three months, the CTA has received more than 3,000 complaints and it says it doesn't have the resources to deal with all of them. Just 570 will be looked at. The remaining complaints will have to wait. That's the first set of complaints that we'll look at. Uh, and our hope is that through this inquiry and some of the jurisprudence, some of the decisions that we'll issue, uh, we may be able to clarify some issues that will facilitate the resolution of the remaining complaints. Consumer advocates say airlines may be bending the rules, so an inquiry is necessary. You should expect a high volume of complaints because, first of all, consumers finally have rights, and secondly, airlines are likely to interpret it in the most favorable way to them as possible, which means there'll be a lot of denials. Wei says he's out more than $5,000, so he's not too happy about how his complaint is being handled. There just seems to be something amiss here. There just really is. When the government says that you're allowed compensation and someone can get back to me in two days and just slough me off and say, no, you're, you're not, Way hopes money eventually comes his way, but says he won't be flying Air Canada anymore. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Toronto. At Canada's busiest airport, bad weather was to blame today for lots of frustration. The wind too strong, the visibility too poor. That meant delays and cancellations for dozens of flights. At least a quarter of today's departures were scrubbed, almost a third of arrivals too. And many flights still are not back on track. Well, Harry and Meghan will soon give up their royal titles, but not their global celebrity. Canadians have made it clear they do want them to be safe living here. They just don't want to pick up their hefty security bill. And as Evan Dyer reports, soon they won't have to. Why should we? We've got enough other things to go on without uh, paying for their security. I'm sure they can afford to do it themselves. They're welcome here as anybody else is welcome here, right? But um, yeah, I mean, they've got their own money. They should pay for their own security. People in Calgary all seem to be of the same view today. Toronto too. There's other needs uh, in Canada that are much more urgent than paying for princesses. They probably should just uh, pay for themselves and um, yeah, I think it's a little bit outrageous to expect Canadians to pay for it. The Trudeau government has been asked about security costs for weeks. Discussions uh, continue to be ongoing. As talks with the UK dragged on. And we continue to be in discussions uh, with uh, the UK. Today, the government acknowledged it's already been giving Harry and Meghan protection, but now plans to stop. The RCMP were advised that the, these two individuals still had international protected person status, and so, therefore, the RCMP have been intermittently assisting uh, the London Met in providing security. Um, that arrangement is, is coming to an end. The government says that when the couple came to Canada in November, they were still working members of the royal family. But once it became clear that this was no mere visit, and when the couple announced they'd be giving up their official royal duties, the calculation shifted. The British press have dubbed March 31st Mexit Day, the day the couple will cease all official functions, and it seems Canada's obligations to them will end the same day. We're very pleased. It looks like they have read the public's uh, mind on this. The public doesn't want money going to them, and they've acted accordingly. And even monarchists agree. 
Well, I think it's it's perfectly logical. You know, that that security is for working members of the royal family who are supporting the work of Her Majesty as Queen of Canada. Today's decision frees Canadian taxpayers from a bill that could be anywhere between 10 and 30 million dollars a year, and it means London and the couple themselves now have to figure out who picks up that tab. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. Well, appliance manufacturers say their products usually last about 10 years, but many of you were surprised to hear that. Do you believe that? No. They don't last. They're not they as good. They don't last, no. Why is it so hard to get them repaired? A marketplace investigation coming up. The Trudeau government's conflicting priorities laid bare by pipeline protests. Rosie is here with that issue. Plus, as if the winter weather wasn't enough. Just fix it, like just fix it. Another morning of transit headaches in Ottawa. We're back in two. Security forces in India are contending with a sharp and deadly division within the country. Religion is at the heart of the violence and the scale of the damage, hundreds hurt, more than 30 killed. Briar Stewart shows us just how bad things have gotten. In the streets of New Delhi today, widespread mourning as families begin to bury their dead. After days of some of the worst sectarian violence the Indian capital has seen in decades. It began Monday when mobs swarmed neighborhoods. Some wielded sticks, others carried guns. In some cases, homes and buildings were set ablaze. They burned the entire house. I have nothing left, says this man. This 85-year-old woman died after being trapped on the roof with the rest of her family while her home burned. The riots erupted as U.S. President Donald Trump visited the country, taking part in carefully staged photo ops with India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Modi is being blamed by some for stoking the violence with the contentious citizenship law that his Hindu Nationalist Party introduced last year. It grants citizenship to illegal immigrants from neighboring countries, but not for Muslims. <laughs> Members of the Indian Muslim Federation in London have been protesting the law since December, saying it marginalizes Muslims who are a religious minority in India. I'm frightened. Everybody frightened. Shamsuddin Agha says the images he's seeing from India are heartbreaking. How does that make you feel about just how divided the country is becoming? I'm very sad. I'm very sad because they don't realize that divisiveness may give them power to some for some time, but on the whole, it will weaken India. Police and security forces were deployed to the streets today to try and instill calm, but there remains fear and mistrust amid now, too, all of the grief. Briar Stewart, CBC News, London. Meantime, here are some of the stories we are watching across Canada tonight. I believe that 2020 has the potential to be a turnaround year for the economy in this province. Alberta tabled its latest budget today with a commitment to getting the province back to balance by 2023. The United Conservative government is banking on increased investment in the oil industry to do so, but also plans for significant cuts to the public service, which sparked a large protest outside the legislature in Edmonton tonight. Fiat Chrysler says it's cutting the third shift at its Windsor assembly plant, meaning some 1,500 unionized workers will be out of a job by the end of June. The announcement comes as the automaker works to phase out production of the Dodge Grand Caravan. Plans to eliminate the shift were first announced last March. Controversial Senator Lynn Bayak has been suspended from the Red Chamber again. This comes two days after she formally apologized for posting racist letters to her Senate webpage. For years, she has insisted she did nothing wrong. The reason for this latest suspension? Bayak failed to complete anti-racism training she was told to go through after the last time she was suspended. And it was yet another chaotic day for commuters on Ottawa's embattled light rail system. Just fix it. Like, just fix it. If it doesn't work, shut it down and put the buses back. Frustration, clearly, as thousands of commuters were met with crowded platforms, buses and trains during rush hour. A series of problems, including broken cables, resulted in passengers having to evacuate trains and in one case, requiring them to walk along the tracks in a downtown tunnel. Okay, coming up, the dying art of appliance repair. 
marketplace talks to consumers fed up with being forced to buy new. Next, though, it's Rosie with At Issue. Tonight, Andrew, we're talking about big promises and big challenges for Ottawa. How can the federal government reconcile some of its key priorities? Chantal, Andrew, Althea, and Jason Markasoff are all here, and we'll see you right after this break. victory for dialogue and, and, and peaceful resolution. I'm looking forward to the meeting. Uh, obviously, this is very important. Efforts today between Ottawa, B.C. and the Wet'suwet'en hereditary chiefs to move forward. But the political challenges for this federal government are far from over, especially after a week where its priorities of the environment, energy projects and reconciliation have continued to clash. What's good for Canada is to create common ground in which we recognize that the environment and the economy must go hand in hand. He, he, he has a balanced approach. He's failing on the environment and he's failing to get jobs built. So so is balance possible? How can the federal government reconcile these priorities moving forward? It's Thursday, and I'm here with that issue. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto. Althea Raj is in Ottawa. And Jason Markasoff is in Edmonton tonight. Good to see everybody. So I, I know this meeting is, is happening uh, between the hereditary chiefs and the government, but I, I, I want to talk more about where the government is on those big issues over the past few weeks, where they've had to see, you know, those three priorities collide. And, and how uh, the Prime Minister and how the government has done with trying to balance all those things. Let me start with you on this, Andrew. I guess you'd say not well. I mean, it was a tricky proposition, but a doable one, which is that you were going to balance not just the environment and the economy, but also re reconciliation. So it was sort of a three-cornered act. Um, but you're always going to be distrusted by people on all sides in these types of things. The middle ground can be treacherous ground. And while that's partly a, a, a function of people's um, uh, irascibility or their unwillingness to compromise. Mm -hmm. It also is the part and parcel of the job of the leader to try and find that middle ground and to convince everybody that you are that middle ground. And I mm. think part of the problem is that through successive missteps, they've allowed each side at one point or another to decide these guys really aren't on the level, they really aren't uh, trying to balance and things, they're just on the other guy's side. And we now have the situation where that whereas there are lots of people who would like to occupy that middle ground, um, the, the debate's being dominated by the extremes now. Hmm. Uh, Chantal, do, do you think that this is, uh, the compromise is possible and, and that the government doesn't know how to get there or that it's more like what Andrew's talking about? Well, uh, the problem of the government beyond the, all that Andrew uh, spelled out, uh, which I happen to agree with, is uh, that they are trying to find balance between energy and the environment, to name those two, at the time when a clock is ticking and when public opinion is moving uh, and becoming more mobilized on the climate change front. So that middle ground is there, but it is up to a point shrinking. Mm. And the government has tried to straddle that fence. It was spared this week having to make a call on uh, the tech mine and probably lucky for it because there is no consensus on where the balance is even within the government. Yeah. Add to that uh, the fact that there is no consensus within First Nations and Indigenous communities either. Uh, and you have the elements of a mix that is increasingly difficult to make into a whole. Uh, Althea, do, do you think that the, the government sort of raised expectations too high in terms of where it could find this, this middle ground that seems so elusive? Uh, no. <laughs> but uh, I think it required perhaps more over communication on this front um, mm. than we have seen. Um, I think there was a lot um, that the government just took for granted that people would understand, you know, that they would say no to Northern Gateway, but they would say yes to Keystone, or sorry, Trans Mountain, mm -hmm. and that they would even go so far as to purchase the pipeline. And on the purchasing of the pipeline, they did start communicating, but they almost kind of seemed to have forgotten that other part of the equation they talked about during the 2015 campaign, the idea of a social license. And what we're seeing more and more is that that grand bargain, that consensus building that Andrew and Chantal are talking about, is being dominated by parties that don't want to give an inch away, mm -hmm. that are seeing this as like a zero-sum game. And I think that speaks to kind of a, a polarizing that we're seeing around the world, frankly. 
So where you are, Jason, then, how, I mean, I, I, is the, the notion that a balance between those, those three corners, as Andrew calls it, is that even something that people are willing to contemplate, or, or are they not at this point even really listening to the federal government? And I'm generalizing. I know the, pro yeah, the province yeah. is I different, mean, but you know what I mean. A, the provincial yeah. government, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's important, I think, say, in Alberta, there's increasingly more purchase for the idea that um, Alberta should act um, more firmly on climate change than uh, much firmer than Jason Kenney wants, but right. much of the province is used to the way things had been, that finding the balance meant figuring out the uh, reconciliation and the climate change stuff eventually, but approving the oil sands project, keeping going on the project. And that was a policy not just, you know, a practice not just uh, by the Conservative government under Harper, but also past Liberal governments and everybody else. So they're just trying to, they're still used to this. Uh, the challenge, uh, the challenge that both sides wind, or all sides wind up facing on this is that, Al, you know, Trudeau wants to find a middle, but he actually can't, doesn't know where that middle is and has trouble articulating where that middle is. And so when that happens, you have both sides pushing him to try to land closer to their side. Um, when, when it comes down to, you know, uh, what seemed like it might have been a popularity vote or just a vote in a firm debate within cabinet on what, what what actually was it, particularly the middle on how much more oil sands uh, mining to develop to allow to develop? Um, it's no wonder that a company just has no idea where things are going to land and wants to save some face by pulling their project. Uh, just uh, to yeah, add, yeah. Well, two things: uh, there should be no illusion that uh, a government of another stripe would have an easier ride of getting projects done or. Uh, doing uh, indigenous reconciliation or finding sure. a way to get indigenous communities on side with projects. Sure. That's obvious. But we talked after the last election about how climate change had become a top of mind issue for a lot of voters. It drives votes. One of the results of that is that a lot of liberals who campaigned in the last election narrowly won their seats against people who were willing to outbid them on climate change. So yeah. it's, it's now become a ballot box issue. That's probably good, but it also means that the people who are sitting in the House of Commons on the government side are thinking, if we don't do well on this, we're going to go down. What people on all sides of these multiple issues, I think, have got to take on board is you are not going to win. And I think that's what's driving this, is everybody thinks they can win a total victory. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 you know, the hardline environmentalists say, we can just shut in the oil sands tomorrow. The, the hardline anti-climate change people say, oh, it's all just a hoax. Uh, you know, some people say we can just we can police 5,000 miles of, of uh, a railway and prevent any demonstrations. Or some people think that we can just wave away Canadian claims to territorial sovereignty. Mm -hmm. None of these things are going to happen. Everybody's got a kind of a veto. Here. That, that, that sounds logical, Jason. I mean, at some point, everybody sort of will have to bend on something, but is it something that you can see happening uh, under a Jason Kenney government? I mean, J Jason Kenney, again, is, is very firmly, you know, he's, he's really staked himself on oil, um, so much so that he's now seems, seems to be willing to actually invest government money. Um, in purchasing an oil company, creating an oil company, and this is Jason Kenney we're talking about, um, who is you know the most conservative guy and doesn't believe in such statist yeah. socialist right. uh, matters. <laughs> it, it's challenge. I mean, the challenge for, for Trudeau is that you know he has on one side he has the conservatives offering the moral clarity that uh, that Andrew Coyne uh, rightly criticizes, and the other side he has the NDP Green Party and Bloc offering moral clarity on the other side. Um, you can look like a moderate. Uh, if you just take a middle ground. But at this point, it just seems like he's indecisive, Trudeau, mm -hmm. uh, figuring out where exactly to land in between those. And that's I'll not a good look. Okay, Althea, last, uh, last 30 seconds to you. Well, I think it just speaks to an absence of leadership. Like, you can't be a, a cheerleader for your side, or at least the Prime Minister should not be a cheerleader for any any side. I mean, he does not play the role. And I, frankly, I, I don't think that Jason Kenney should be a, a cheerleader for a side either. I think he should be uh, acting as a leader. What we're, what we're seeing is that the politics, to Chantal's right, uh, very clearly say where the Liberal Party should go. Mm -hmm. um, but I think he also needs to explain to those potential voters that, you know, and the budget is a great opportunity for the yes. Liberal government to come out and say, you know, a lot of emissions come from buildings and transportation, and we're going to focus on this as well. It's not just the big bad oil mm -hmm. sands that are going to have to pay a price. Okay, I'm going to take a short break, but we've got a round two with At Issue right after this. And a look at the race to replace Andrew Scheer. The first deadline for candidates was today. Who's in? Do we actually have a race? We'll be right back.
Today marks the first deadline for Conservative Party leadership hopefuls. And after much talk over who was not running, we now know who is, at least until the next deadline. So do we actually have a race? Welcome back to another round of At Issue. Chantal, Andrew, Althea and Jason all here tonight to talk about the race that I don't know. <laughs> I just I feel very meh about it so far. I hope it gets more interesting. I assume that it will. Chantal, what, what do you make of whether this is going to be uh, the race I think that the Conservative Party needs? What we know as of today is that there is no big star waiting in the wings secretly signing up members <laughs> to shake things up. Uh, so. It's, uh, you know, Aaron O'Toole, Peter McKay, leading candidates, uh, Marilyn Gladue as uh, a possible uh, leading candidate too, but, and a lot of people who don't have uh, really national profiles running yeah. again. I think we will really know seriously the shape of that campaign after the next deadline in March, mm -hmm. uh, w when people who want to run actually have to come up with a lot more money and a lot more signatures. I suspect the names we have today on your board will not all be on the next board mm -hmm. for the debates. Uh, Althea, what, what do you think of where we're at? Well, this may not be the race the Conservative Party needed, but it's the race the Conservative Party designed. And it's so <laughs> restrictive yeah. that basically the candidates are not being asked to appeal to anybody that basically isn't already a party member. You only have six and a half weeks, almost seven weeks, to sell party memberships. The deadline is April 17th. The debates don't even happen until April 17th and April 23rd. So you're already talking to people that have purchased a Conservative Party membership. Mm -hmm. You're not trying to encourage more people to come into the party fold by exposing them to all of your candidates and saying, hey, we have a message that resonates with you. Come join us. Um, the and we're already seeing that, frankly. Um, we're seeing the party tack far more to the right, even, I would argue, more to the right than they tacked in the last election campaign, mm -hmm. where I think the message, at least public opinion polls suggested and the poll on election day suggested, mm -hmm. that that wasn't the message that voters wanted to hear. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's certainly not the race that would grow uh, the base in, an, uh, in a general, uh, Andrew, but maybe that's not important at this stage. I don't know. Maybe people really aren't paying attention. Well, I favor leadership races if you're going to have leadership races rather than the caucus choosing it that are for the people who are actually devoted and, con and committed to the party sure. rather than uh, you know glorified membership drives but I agree look that this may well boil down to Peter McKay and Aaron O'Toole neither of whom are particularly representative of where the party is so yeah you're seeing them both posturing and trying to pander to that base but mostly because they know that they're not really of that they're not really representative of the of the small c conservative strain of the party right now so they're kind of having to do this kind of per performance. And I'm not sure anybody's particularly persuaded. I think there's a lot of dismay and, 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 and boredom in the party that, that this is the options they've been presented, rather than people with really strong ideas and, and, and a willingness to actually propose major changes in the way the country's governed. You're getting this kind of raw meat stuff being thrown out so that they don't have to commit to it very much. Jason, you're watching it from there. What do you make of it? It's, I mean, I actually was at an Aaron O'Toole event uh, last night in uh, just south of Edmonton, and um, I, I was stunned at how how pale and old the crowd was. Um, they're not, they're barely trying to, uh, to to bring in new new blood at this point. Yeah. Um, you know, that'll be for the election. These are just trying to, you know, get the hardened volunteers, the hardened donors um, in. And I also look at this in relative, in comparison to what we're watching south of the border with the Democratic primary. Right. Um, and, ha and how extensively those candidates are being vetted, battle tested, having debates among each yeah. other, really thrashing out. We're learning who they are. Yeah. Um, we're, with, with, this, with this system they're doing, um, they're not going to offer any of the uh, up-and-comers um, some opportunity to debate unless they're verified and get their $300,000, which is a very tall order. Um, and the risk of that is that somebody's going to come out of this, Aaron O'Toole or Peter McKay or whoever else, is going to come out of this process not being battle-tested, not being vetted. Okay, I, I, got, I got to leave it there. Before we go, be, thank you all. I appreciate it. Forgot to say my thanks. Be sure to subscribe to Ad Issue, the podcast for extra content. This week, we're going to keep talking about what we're just talking about. That's why I cut them off quickly, because we're going to keep talking now about the Conservative leadership race. Look for it on any major podcast app, our website, cbcnews.ca slash the national. For now, though, it's back to Andrew in Toronto. Thanks, Rosie. If you feel like home appliances just don't last like they used to, you might be right. Up next, a marketplace investigation looks at why it's so hard to get them repaired. Plus, her owners had almost lost hope, but wait till you hear about Zoe the dog's unbelievable year long journey home.
Only about a third of Canadians who've had a major appliance breakdown are happy with how the manufacturer responded. That's according to a survey conducted for CBC Marketplace. This week, David Common looks at how long appliances are lasting and why buying new may be the only option when things go wrong. You're yeah. shopping again. This is the expense that I do not want to get to. Mahul Dalakia is shopping for a fridge once again. His died after just six years and he couldn't get the part to fix it anywhere. It is bad. Nearly one in three Canadians we surveyed say they've had an appliance break when it was less than five years old. Though the association representing appliance makers sees things differently. Our data shows, and it's been relatively unchanged over the past two decades, that the average lifespan is about 10 years for appliances. Do you believe that? No. They don't last. They're not they as good. They don't last, no. One big reason Canadians told us is how hard it is to find parts, even for relatively new machines. In Europe, it's a very different story. And then uh, over here? Here, lifespan testing is underway, and by next year, laws will require manufacturers to make replacement parts readily available. The list of spare parts, they have to be available for like 10 years, uh, and then they are supposed to be delivered within 15 working days uh, after a request. These laws would give consumers more power to repair their appliances rather than buy new when they break. Consumer advocates like Nathan Proctor are fighting to bring that to North America. If you want products that last longer, that are better for the environment, that cost less to maintain, you should want right to repair. But the big brands are pushing back. We are very concerned about the safety implications. By not backing some form of right to repair, it seems like consumers are being forced to buy new. Right, so we never want to deny anyone a choice. Mahul feels like his choice was taken away. He wishes right to repair existed here. Instead, he's got a new fridge and a lighter wallet. David Common, CBC News, Brampton. Now, Marketplace also commissioned a survey to understand which brands Canadians say break down the most. You can watch The Right to Repair tomorrow at 8 p.m., 8.30 in Newfoundland on CBC Television and always on GEM. Okay, let's turn now to some of the other stories making headlines tonight. Starting with a deadly attack by Syrian government forces on Turkish soldiers. 33 were killed. It happened in Syria's Idlib province, not far from the Turkish border. Those Syrian forces, backed by Russia, are trying to retake control of the region from rebels and Turkey has sent thousands of troops there to try to stop them. It says 1,700 Syrian troops have been, quote, neutralized in recent weeks. I think the first thing I should do is apologize to the citizens of Baltimore who put their faith and trust in me as their mayor. Disgraced ex-Baltimore mayor Catherine Pugh has been sentenced to three years in jail for using proceeds from fraudulent book sales to fund her re-election bid. Pugh pleaded guilty last November to conspiracy and tax evasion. She resigned in May after FBI agents raided City Hall and homes that she owned. Actor Lori Loughlin and her husband, a fashion designer, will be among the first to face trial in the U.S. college admission scandal. Today, a federal judge set an October 5th trial date for the couple, as well as six other parents. The remaining parents, including B.C. businessman David Sidhu, are set to appear in court in January next year. Okay, get this. A Newfoundland dog named Zoe survived the wilderness for 11 months. But now she's finally home. You will not want to miss her reunion with her owners in our moment. Next. Zoe the dog escaped from a backyard in rural Newfoundland last April. And her owners had almost lost hope of ever seeing her again. Then, a stroke of luck. Late last year, she was caught on surveillance video foraging for food. And then for months, despite freezing temperatures and a historic snowstorm, her owner set out traps, desperately trying to catch her and bring her home. It finally worked. And that is tonight's moment. Are you happy, Peter? Yeah. Yeah. Honestly, it was like a fairy tale. I was seeing it with my own eyes, but I just couldn't believe it. The other night, we got a call around 2 a.m. Our amazing volunteer, uh, Jackie McCormick, had in fact finally lured Zoe into the trap. We had been warned by many people that it was likely Zoe would be feral, especially after being out in the wild for almost 11 months. 
but there were no growls, there were no barks, just a timid dog. Peter had had this amazing connection built with Zoe from day one. And due to this connection, I knew without a doubt, without a question, that it was him she would open up to the most. It seems she's come home with a newfound confidence. There were moments in time when I just looked at Zoe and I would start to tear up because it just, it seems so surreal, so unimaginable that she's here now and, you know, she's so confident and she's doing so well. Tough dog. Um, it, you heard her mention volunteers there. This was indeed a community effort to find Zoe again. In fact, there was a, a Facebook group that was created. They called it Help Find Zoe. Its name has since been changed to Welcome Home Zoe. That's the National for this February 27th. Have a good night.